Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. It's a pleasure to be able to introduce our Faith in Culture series with celebrated author and editor at large of America Magazine, Father James Martin of the Society of Jesus. And as we begin, I'd like to take a moment to express my gratitude to Paul Eli, Senior Fellow at our Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, for his leadership of our Faith and Culture series over these past 14 years. This series has enabled our community to engage with extraordinary artists and writers and filmmakers in conversations that deepen our understanding of both faith and culture. For today's conversation, we are partnering with several offices across our university, and I'd like to thank our Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, our Office of Mission and Ministry, our Office of Campus Ministry, and our John Main Center for Meditation and Interreligious Dialogue. This afternoon, we have the privilege of hearing from Father Jim Martin on writing as a spiritual practice. In addition to his work as editor-at-large of one of our nation's leading periodicals, America Magazine, Father Martin serves as a consultant to the Vatican's Secretariat for Communications, a role to which he was appointed by Pope Francis in 2017. Today, we have the opportunity to hear about his life and his work as an author. He's a prolific writer, having written about many aspects of spirituality and faith for a wide audience from a hopeful examination of the relationship between the Catholic Church and the LGBT community in his book, Building a Bridge, to reflections on humor and joy in spiritual life in his book, Between Heaven and Mirth. His 2012 book, The Jesuit Guide to Almost Everything, A Spirituality for Real Life, was a New York Times bestseller. And his 2014 book, Jesus, a Pilgrimage, won an Illumination Award and a Catholic Press Association Book Award. His latest book published this year is Learning to Pray, a Guide for Everyone, an exploration of all that prayer can mean and the many forms it can take in our lives. As one bookless review put it, Father Martin examines how, and I quote, Prayer is building a relationship with God in the way other relationships are built, through conversing, listening, and spending time with one another. With Martin's guidance, interested readers may see prayer as both the most natural yet transcendent thing in the world, close quote. Through his writings, his work as an editor and as a priest, he has explored ways to share the rewards and complexities of a life of faith with a wide audience, inviting readers to expand and deepen their own experiences of spirituality, faith, and prayer. We're honored to have Father Martin with us today. And to join him in conversation, we're so pleased to have our moderator, Paul Eli. Paul is the author of The Life You Save May Be Your Own, which won the Penn Martha Albrand Award for First Nonfiction and Reinventing Bach. His essays and articles have appeared in The Atlantic, The New York Times, Vanity Fair, Commonweal, and he's now a regular contributor to The New Yorker. Prior to his time at Georgetown, Paul worked in book, book publishing for many years as a senior editor with Farrar strauss Giraud. I'm grateful to Paul for the curiosity, the inquiry, the joy that he brings to our community and to his leadership of our faith and culture series. And I know like all of you, I look forward to today's conversation. So I'll turn it over now to Paul and to Father Martin. Thank you very much, President DeJoya, uh, for taking time out of the day to introduce this event and for hosting it and for hosting all the events that we've done really since the pandemic began. And thanks to our audience too. Before we begin our conversation, I'd like to thank you for tuning in via Zoom and also thank those who are joining us on Facebook and YouTube. The event's gonna be recorded and posted later on the Berkeley Center website. And if you've signed up for this event, you'll um, get a link to, to it in a few days. After the conversation, we're gonna have a live Q&A with the Zoom audience to 
participate in that, uh, if you'd like to do that, you should submit a question through the chat feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And then a staff member will notify if your question is selected. And at that point, you should be prepared to appear on screen and pose your question. Uh, with all that said, uh, Father Martin, thank you and welcome, Jim. I've missed seeing you, uh, and it's good to see you again this way. My pleasure. Good to be with you, Paul, and thanks to the Berkeley Center and uh, President Joy and Georgetown for inviting me into this conversation. You know, I think the last few summers we formed a practice of uh, on what invariably was the hottest day of August, <laughs> uh, meeting for lunch at a Neapolitan restaurant in Midtown and pretending we were in Italy and then stepping out into the smothering heat of a very crowded block. And I, I'm, I'm saying it because I missed it uh, uh, pretty significantly when we didn't get a chance to do that last summer. So here we are talking instead. I did too. And I always felt bad for you because you were always biking in and we had to bike back where I just had to walk back to my nice air conditioned office. So yeah, it's nice to be with you and have a virtual chat and have uh, people who can uh, listen in. We've talked about so many things over the years, but uh, I've never really asked you about how spirituality and writing fit together. And then when proofs of learning to pray arrived, one day I sat down to read it. You know, I'm going to read Jim Martin's book today. But it didn't work out that way because it's a very rich book with uh, many parts, which is a quick and deep plunge into a different area of prayer and the spiritual life. So I found myself reading it in, in small bursts and in bursts that I realized coincided with time that I might have set aside for prayer or uh, at the beginning or the end of the day. And I thought to myself, this is um, uncanny that, I, that I'm uh, using this book as an invitation to um, uh, daily spirituality. Uh, is that um, licit for one thing? Am I, am I okay doing that? And then it led me to wonder about how that fits into your own writing process. And, and well, here we are. So thanks for the book. And I guess the obvious first question is, um, how, how did you write it? Well, for and thank you for that. those nice compliments. I think it makes sense. I'm happy that people are using it for spiritual reading. I think anything that you know prompts prayer is, is helpful in that regard. Uh, I had known for a long time that I wanted to write a book on prayer. I wrote an earlier book called The Jesuit Guide to Almost Everything that President DeJoy mentioned that was about Ignatian uh, or Jesuit spirituality. And there was a little in there about prayer, but it was more about the spiritual life in general. And I had long thought that there was a, you know, there was a need for a book uh, that really talked about the nuts and bolts of prayer. And in particular, what happens when you pray? I think so many books on the spiritual life uh, are very vague and it frustrates people because look, let's be blunt. Uh, many people sit down to pray. They know that prayer is important. They close their eyes and they don't know what's supposed to happen or what to do or what to expect. And then they get discouraged and then they, they move on and say, well, prayer is clearly not for me. I'm not holy enough. God is not interested in me and must be for someone else. And they move on. So I, I really wanted to make a book that was inviting, accessible, and uh, you know, really blunt about these things. It, it's certainly uh, inviting, accessible, and blunt. Uh, the word that struck me in what you just said, though, is specific. Um, the attention to detail, whether it's um, a detail from a childhood story, or the detail from something that Father William Berry sets out in a book, or the precise um, uh, words, obviously translated from the French, that Therese of Lisieux uh, describes prayer, what is it, a surge, a surge, a surge the from heart. the heart. Mm -hmm. There's so much contained in those five words, mm -hmm. a surge from the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, reading that, I know I'll never forget it because of its specificity, Therese's specificity, mm -hmm. but also yours in, in citing it. And so you just, did you set out to, to load the book with specifics about prayer or is that more of a general practice in your writing? No, that's a great question. I set out to be a kind of carry along spiritual director for people. And I know the kinds of questions that people ask. I know the kinds of questions that I asked when I started out praying really in earnest as a Jesuit novice. And I think people deserve clear answers. So for example, what, what happens in prayer? Why did this insight come up? How do I know if this insight is coming from God? Um, how do I pray? Um, is it okay to have these periods of dryness? So I, I wanted to be a kind of, um, you know, a kind of resource for people that I, I figure may not have a spiritual director. 
And these are the kinds of things, you know, I've been a Jesuit for 30 years. I've been a spiritual director for about 20 years. These are the kinds of things that come up uh, in prayer. It's like going to the doctor's office. You want an answer to your question. You know, like, what, what is, why do I have this pain in my back? Well, those things come with age. That's not helpful. What is it? What do I do about it? How do I take care of it? Is it going away? And, you know, the same kind of questions uh, I get as a spiritual director. And I, I, I wanted it to be um, specific. And I ask specific questions. And they are basically the questions that I, I'm, I'm answering the questions that I've been asked over 20 years as a director. All that. And then you're also, it seems to me, answering questions that you've either asked yourself or relating other people's questions to experiences that you had yourself. Is that um, typical in spiritual direction to draw on the director's own experience to the extent that you do? Well, what a great question. In classic spiritual direction, you're not supposed to talk about your experiences, although people find it helpful sometimes when you can share a little bit because, you know, it's not about you. It's, it's about helping the other person. For those who don't know what it is, it's helping the other person notice where God is active in their, in their prayer and in their daily life. Uh, I think writing about um, spirituality is different, though. I think that people, in, in a sense, have come to expect that you're going to be transparent. And I find that, and we've talked about this, the books that I find the most um, useful in the spiritual life are ones like those, for example, of Henry Nouwen or Thomas Merton, especially his journals. I know you've written a lot about Thomas Merton, where he is frank and he's open. And, and I find that kind of narrative theology really, uh, really hooks me. It, and in a sense, it, it reminds the reader that, you know, the author struggles. And so, you know, there's nothing to be embarrassed about if you have dry periods in prayer or if you get distracted or if you don't know if this is God. So I, I think it helps to create a bond with the reader. It's, it's certainly something that I find, as I said, in um, engrossing in other spiritual writers. It's definitely striking. I find the balance very satisfying in the book between the, the lore of prayer, the recent... Um, two greatest generations of Jesuits, let's say, and all that they have to say about prayer, uh, and then people you've directed, and then your own experiences. The variety is part of what uh, make, makes the book um, work so well. I guess uh, when I'm thinking about how that relates to writing, I wonder uh, how, how conscious a strategy of it was it to bring yourself in and to be um, not quite the wounded healer, but the uh, sometimes thwarted prayer and and lead us along a path that you yourself have been on. Yeah, it was very conscious. Uh, I mean, I was very careful not to put too much of myself in because, you know, as the saying goes, that's not about me and it's not about my prayer life. So and I was very careful to bring other voices in as well. Uh, in fact, um, I, I bring in quotes specifically from a wide variety of, um, you know, Catholic spiritual writers. And then, you know, from time to time when it's appropriate to bring in uh, questions and experiences, you know, disguised, of course, uh, and, you know, anonymous from people who have come to me for direction. And some of them, Paul, are just simply so memorable that you can't leave them out. I mean, there's, there's some things that are so illustrative of what I'm trying to say and what I'm trying to get across, you know, that have happened in spiritual direction that, you know, it would be crazy to leave these examples out. Uh, you know, for example, one of, the, one of the stories I tell is the examination of conscience uh, is the end of the day prayer where you review where you have experienced God throughout the day. And I, I talk in the, in the chapter about the examine about, um, you know, problems and struggles that people have with the examine. There are many of them. And one of them is, which is very common and very sort of homey, is I fall asleep. It's the end of the day and I fall asleep and I say, all right, and, that, and people tell me that a lot. What do I do? And so, you know, you, you change the time, you, uh, you moderate the way you're doing it. And I, I, one of the Jesuit, young Jesuits who saw me, who will remain nameless, uh, said to me, I'm falling asleep. And I said, well, why is that? Are you very tired at night? Well, not really. Well, let's look at your, your sort of kind of practice of prayer at night. And I said, what do you do? And I expected him to say I was sitting down or I was kneeling down. And he said, well, I brush my teeth. I put on my pajamas and I got under the covers. <laughs> I put my head on the pillow and I fall asleep and I don't know why. And I said, here's a suggestion. <laughs> why don't you do the examine before you get under the cover? So even so, I mean, I could not use that, that story. Um, and actually I, I've made it so anonymous that I've forgotten which Jesuit has told me that. One of the distinctions that you make that I find really useful is between the examine of conscience and the examine of consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, how, 
Um, can you explain that distinction uh, for the audience? Yeah, sure. So the examination of conscience, as I mentioned, is a review of the day. And I talk about it a lot in the book. And anyone who's familiar with Jesuit spirituality knows about the examination of conscience, often called the examine um, from the Spanish name. This is uh, from St. Ignatius Loyola. George Ashenbrenner, who was a great uh, spiritual writer, um, thought that the, the word examine, the phrase examination of conscience had what he called overly moralistic overtones. And it is true because an examination of conscience is often what people would do before they go to confession. So he preferred uh, the term examination of consciousness. Okay. Now I, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I think there's, there's a certain wisdom in that because it is not about your sins. It is not a, a catalog cataloging of your sins or doing an inventory of your sins. I prefer this sort of traditional phrase examination of conscience. I think examination of consciousness for me, I mean, even as, as, as valuable as Ashenbrenner's insight is, makes it sound like you're asking yourself if you're conscious. And I don't think that really works either. Most Jesuits usually just use the term examine, which is, has, has none of the, uh, neither of those overtones. I think the work that Ashenbrenner had in mind of shift, shifting uh, off the associations of the word was significant. Mm -hmm. But in the book, I associate it, and I guess you meant us to associate it with a process akin to the one that you described uh, when you went up to Bennington College uh, with an acting troupe, which is, has to do with being conscious, being aware, being present, being there. Um, is, is that right? Yeah, that's right. It's, it's a prayer of awareness. It's a prayer of noticing. Uh, and it's, it's asking someone to cast their eyes or their mind or their heart back over the day or the last 24 hours, because it's often easier to see where God was than it is to see where God is or where, or where God will be. And it, it starts with uh, placing yourself in the presence of God. It asks you to uh, be grateful for certain things because we tend to move on. Uh, we tend to be problem solvers and not sort of settle and savor the graces, as Ignatius would say. And then it asks you to go through a review of the day where, you know, morning, noon, and night, where did you experience God? Where did you feel God's presence? Your failings and sins come up. You ask for forgiveness, uh, and then you ask for the grace for the next day. And the the story I tell in um, uh, learning to pray is being with the Labyrinth Theater Company on a summer intensive workshop, and they had all these workshops, and they asked me to do a workshop, and I'm not I'm no actor, and this isn't just any theater company, uh, just just yeah. Um, <laughs> I had worked with them. Um, on a play called The Last Days of Judas Iscariot. Um, Philip Seymour Hoffman was the director and uh, uh, Stephen Adley Giergis, who was a Pulitzer Prize winning at this point, uh, playwright did it. So it was a lot of fun. And we went up to Bennington College and I, I led them through the examination of conscience because I thought this is something I can teach them. And one of my favorite lines, I'm not sure if I put it in this book, uh, was an actor who after I led them through essentially a guided meditation of what where God was, in the day before, this actor said, Sal Inzerillo, I remember his name, said, uh, I never knew my yesterday was so beautiful, which gets at the, the heart of the exam. And it's, it's looking back and noticing where God is. Really, very much so. And I guess when I'm reading the anecdote, which was very involved in the book, I was just also thinking of Bennington College as a place which had a famous writing program and Bernard Malam was there and... Uh, Claude Fredericks and some others. And it made me think about the strategies that you're using in this book as analogous to the strategies that a lot of um, teachers of writing use. You had uh, an earlier book, Jesus of Pilgrimage. And so I thought this one could be the sequel, Prayer or Workshop. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great title, actually. There's kind of work in progress uh, quality to the act of prayer and to the prayer uh, in your account of it. Yeah, because I don't think we're ever a master of praying. Uh, you know, it's like saying I'm a master of friendship or a master of love. We're always learning. And any good spiritual director will tell you that. Uh, and I, you know, it was interesting, Paul, um, in terms of the writing process, the book was originally called, because I like blunt titles, the book was originally called How to Pray. And a number of my friends said, you know, that's a little too definite. Like, this is it. This is the way to pray. But, but I wanted a book that people would understand. This is a book about how to pray. And it, I so why not call it How to Pray? And then I thought learning to pray was a little more of a process and because we're all, we're all learners. Uh, and I, I try to frame it again as, as something that everyone can do and that's something that everyone is invited into. It reminded me of a title of one of the volumes of Burton's journals, 
not a title that he gave him, Learning to Love. Mm. And that's Merton in the mid 60s when a lot of different mm-hmm. things were happening. In the book, you mentioned the, the cherished prayer of Thomas Merton's that begins, um, oh, dear Lord, I do not know where I'm going and kind of goes from there. Mm-hmm. And what you explain is that in the act of praying, uh, you find yourself imagining Merton in the mm-hmm. hermitage at Gethsemane composing the prayer and so just in a few words you're taken out of yourself and put into the monastic uh, situation um i read that and thought well i wrote a book involving merton but i don't know how he composed that prayer do you have any idea no idea but i think paul uh you know as you know that life is so appealing for me and thomas merton is one of my big heroes and you know i think your book is uh, without and you know uh this is true. I think your book is one of the best books on Merton, and it taught me a lot about him. Uh, but that that world of of monasticism is so beautiful and so appealing to me that even praying that prayer is an entree into that. And I'd, I imagine him sitting in his desk in his hermitage. Who knew when he did it? He could have typed it up, and you know, and when he was you know right as a a, a novice or something. Um, and I think for a lot of people one of the things I say is that the, these rote or standard or formalized prayers, which a lot of people denigrate as kind of less than, uh, are very valuable. I mean, they give us words to say when the words won't come. Sometimes they express our, our emotions better than we ever could. Uh, and again, they are kind of, they're kind of connection uh, with, with these great figures. And so, you know, if you pray the serenity prayer, you can think about Reinhold Niebuhr. If you pray a prayer by Therese of Lisieux, you think about her. And there's, there's a beautiful connection there. And there's something beautiful about even Merton, even Thomas Merton um, saying, you know, it's, it's a prayer about not knowing where he's going and trusting, though, that the desire to please God does, in fact, please God. And it's OK to have that desire to know that someone like Thomas Merton, that one of the great spiritual masters of the 20th century, maybe of all time, he even he even he struggled with discernment and knowing God's will, I think, is very comforting for people. I'm really glad that you want to stick with Burton because sure. I have a couple more questions. <laughs> know, on right. The um, one has to do, well, it's an insight followed by a question, I suppose. The insight is that um, in my book, uh, The Life You Saved May Be Your Own, the way I characterize Merton is as a person who's um, uh, shaped by a spirituality of place, an imagined place. He was an orphan. He had lived in three countries by the time he was a young man. He found a place of fixity at Gethsemane and then kind of imagined that he was everywhere else, a monastery in Europe or a Native American reservation in the Southwest or in the Middle Ages or in Alaska or uh, in um, Tibet. And that the, the pr- prayer as a, as, a, as a kind of journey uh, was fundamental to him. So your insight in the book that you are brought to the monastery through the prayer is so basic for him. Um, even if I, I don't think um, you in, you intended to set set it out that way, but it sounds apt or yeah, it it place is important for him. I think also the connection and the relationship uh, between the one who is using that prayer and Merton, who we believe is still praying for us, is, is very important. So so prayer is an act of solidarity with one another, but also with Merton. I feel like when I'm praying that prayer, in a sense, he's praying with me. He's praying right along. And then. Since we don't know how he wrote it, and someone in the audience probably does, uh, the way the prayer is composed, and I don't have it by heart, but it's possible that you do, um, it might as well be a journal entry. Mm-hmm. He's confiding in God in casual language, kind of in a way that gestures towards Dante and being lost in the middle of the road, but is also just a, a, a day when he's a little bit disoriented and he finds words for it. And that led me to. Th- ask or want to ask you is there a meaningful distinction between um, prayerful prose such as Merton made in his journals and what's now a renowned prayer this this prayer of Thomas Merton well I think uh, it no I think if, if it helps you pray right if there's a passage that helps you pray um, and, and is a window to God, I don't think there's much of a difference. I would say, however, that, you know, Merton, I mean, you know, better than anybody, Merton, knowing Merton, he was probably a little clear, even if he was writing it in his journal, that someone would eventually find it, right? So there's always a kind of 
desire to perhaps in his journals to write for someone else. But no, I think, I think, um, I think that anything that someone writes or anything that someone formalizes that can help you encounter God um, is that in, is in its way a prayer, right? I mean, even something simple. Uh, you know, I, I remember the, the title of Anne Lamott's new book or recent book is something like uh, Help, Wow, and Thanks. That those are the three things that she thinks about when she, and even that's a, even that's a kind of, even that's a kind of beautiful prayer. So anything that, anything that I think enables you to feel closer to God or, or opens you up, you know, we're talking you're in your own life, you were talking about reading this book and feeling a desire for prayer. That's terrific. So it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be formal. And it certainly doesn't have to be by someone as famous as Thomas Merton. No question about the desire. I felt uh, so many times not only do I want to do this, but why haven't I been doing more of this kind of prayer already? Uh, is it too late? I'm 55. What did I miss uh, by um, um, not going down a certain road or using a certain set of prayers? But then you're very reassuring in the book. Just uh, don't um, don't fr fret over that uh, lost spiritual life. Just carry on, I guess. Yeah, no. And, and I think even more important uh, that the desire for prayer, that the desire that you feel and the, the desire that others feel is coming from God. Okay. Because how else would God awaken us, awaken in us a desire to get closer to God other than by placing that desire within us, right? So the desire that you feel for God, the desire that people feel for prayers is coming from God. Uh, there's a, I mentioned I saw a plaque in a retreat house somewhere in New Jersey, I think, that summed it up, that which you seek is seeking you. And I think at the beginning of the spiritual life, that's something that people find very comforting because people come to me and they say, I'm interested in praying. I, I feel this desire. And you have to say, well, where do you think that comes from? And once they're encouraged to consider the possibility that it might come from God, they feel a lot less alone. So it's not simply the individual being curious and you know, wanting something. It's, it's a response to a call. And so they feel they feel more that that relationship, and that gives them a lot of um, courage to continue. The way Merton put it in the prayer, I think, was, um, and he he sounds like an undergraduate, really. I mean, he's a spiritual master, but uh, I I trust that the desire to please you is itself pleasing to you, mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it really works. Uh, it, which is great. And one of the things I love about that prayer, um, which starts off, if people want to look it up, it's my Lord God, I don't know where I'm going, uh, is that even people who, I th I've always said that anyone can pray that prayer because at some point everyone has felt lost. And yet that great insight that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I do. And that even if I'm kind of going in the wrong way, I'm trying my best which is really, I think that's 90% of the spiritual life. So it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful prayer. And I, I, I put it in the book um, as an example of a, of, a, of a formal prayer that really expresses what a lot of people feel on a very deep level. But I also just wanted to include it in the book to say, in case you haven't seen it, here it is. One last Merton reference, and then we'll move on. <laughs> sure. Uh, at an important moment in his life, when somebody was putting together an anthology of his work, 62, I think, he looked over the work and he said, you know, I don't know if I've uh, really become a true monk or a true uh, contemplative, but what I do know is that I'm a writer, that I was one before I entered the monastery, I'm still one, and then I'm going to remain one. And when I um, encounter you on, uh, I follow you on Twitter mainly, you know, you're known as a Jesuit, as a spiritual director, advocacy um, for greater openness in the church towards um, the gay and lesbian people. Uh, you're on the um, Dicastri uh, board or whatever it's called in Rome. You're on, on social media, but essentially you must spend large parts of your day writing. Uh, I mean, how, how do you identify yourself interiorly? Thanks for asking that. Um, and I don't get a chance to talk about it very much. I identify myself as a Jesuit who happens to write. That's how I see it. It's an outgrowth of my vocation. write millions of words. <laughs> yeah, but BC, because I don't say... I'm a writer. I, it's even hard for me. I think, look, I'll just be blunt. I think you're a better writer than I am. I think you are. And so I don't say I'm a writer that happens to be a Jesuit. The, the, the sort of ministry of writing and the vocation of writing flows out of my work as a Jesuit. It's part of the desire to bring people closer to God. And one way to do that is through writing. And that's a, something that I've sort of 
been led into, um, I think by the spirit. I mean, I, I enjoy it. As I've told you many times, I would, I would be happy to sit down. I have a little carpal tunnel and it prevents me from writing, but I would be happy to sit at my computer the entire day and write. I, I just love it. I love writing. I love ex ex expressing things. I like trying to bring people closer to God, but it is, it's an outgrowth of my Jesuit vocation. So I'm a Jesuit who happens to write um, as well as happens to do other things too. So then how does that break down on a particular day? I guess if it flows out of your Jesuit vocation, um, what uh, you're in prayer, then you um, kind of like Batman and Robin, you know, move out of the <laughs> it's and, like and into the jump, jump out of my chair and start writing. Yeah, well, you know, it's actually, I mean, people ask me this and I, I always think it's good to be blunt and clear. So I work at America Magazine, as you know, I'm an editor at large, which means I'm sort of, you know, I can do whatever I want. And because of my vow of poverty, all of the royalties from my books and my writings goes to America Magazine because I'm a Jesuit. It's a little bit of a loophole. Normally it goes to the province, but in this case, it goes to the magazine because that's where I'm working. And that makes sense because to use some old business analogy, when I was with GE, that's I'm doing it on company time, right? And so that's in a sense, that's my ministry. That's my main ministry. And so generally um, I get up in the morning and I start writing. I'm working right now on a book on Lazarus, which I'm really enjoying doing. And I'll, I'll research and write for a couple of hours. I'll do some social media things. You know, I have uh, events obviously like this, but the bulk of my day when I'm not traveling is writing, social media, um, researching. And I, I love it. I love it. I really... Um, you know, for, and I think that the Holy Spirit, how is the Holy Spirit involved? Um, I feel, and I've told you this before, that the Holy Spirit uh, moves me with the desire to write a certain thing, not every word. And, and it gives me that grace to be interested in it. So for example, right now I'm writing a book on Lazarus. I am fascinated right now by Lazarus. I am completely fascinated by Lazarus. Anything about Lazarus I, I can read or listen to or learn, it just excites me. And I think that's the Spirit. And it was the same when I was writing the book on prayer, when I was writing the book on Jesus, on LGBT stuff, uh, on Jesuit spirituality, I was fascinated. And I can feel when I'm finishing the book, that grace recede. And that means that I become less interested in it. Uh, and so the, the, the fascination with Lazarus, I think will, will it just happens to me, will, will probably end when the book ends. I mean, I'm curious about him, but I'm almost obsessed with him now. And I think that's one of the ways that the Holy Spirit, at least in my life, has been at work, draws me to want to write about something, gives me the grace to write about it through this interest and this perseverance. And then I can feel it like, a, like, like the tide going out. I can feel the grace leaving as, as, as the book is being finished. And I'm sure this is the same for other authors, but they may sort of express it in a different way. I'm less interested in the topic. And then, then I'm on to something else. So that, that's how I feel the Spirit mainly is at work in me when I write. It reminds me of the term from the life of prayer, desolation, that I know I felt that when finishing both of my long books, I, that um, not quite the long withdrawing roar out of Matthew Arnold, but uh, something that's missing that's been present for a long time. Um, yeah, I would say it's just to respond. It's a little different in my experience. It's not, it's not a kind of loss or a lack. It's more that I'm no longer interested in it. And I'm interested, for example, the, this book, so I was working on learning to pray for whatever, five or 10 years, and I was really interested in it. As, as, it, as it started to sort of be, be finished, uh, and as I was putting the final touches on the galleys and things, I started to become much more interested in Lazarus. So it was as if the spirit was kind of turning my, my gaze towards, towards Lazarus. And now I'm obsessed with him. What about on the level of, of writing practice? There, there are Jesuits who have put AMDG at the top of every page. Um, I intermittently am in the habit of um, saying a quick, or, or mentally saying a quick prayer as, as the computer's booting up uh, to um, begin, begin a serious piece of writing. How, how, um, how, how goes it for you? What, are there, is there a spiritual practice associated with the act of writing? Well, um, you know, so I start each of my days with prayer, with about an hour of prayer. So it's more seeing it in the context of my vocation. I don't do anything specific when I'm writing. 
uh, because a lot of it is also sort of sort of jumping in at different points of the day. So for example, in this Lazarus book, um, you know, I, I, I wrote a little bit this morning. I, I took a break. I came back. I answered some phone calls. So I, I don't mind kind of going in and out. For me, it's, I would say it's the, I mean, this may sound pious, but it's the entirety of my ministry at America that I'm, I'm praying about. So it's not just the writing part. Uh, I do, however, uh, imagine uh, the reader uh, and imagine the reader and, and always try to write something that is, it's going to sound cheesy, but that's helping souls, which is the, uh, the sort of the desire that Ignatius had. So I always write to help souls. I remember a long time ago, um, an author who I will not name, I will, I will name him afterwards after we talk, uh, said to me, why do you write? And I said to help people. And he said, that's a terrible reason to write. You should write for the art. You should write. And I, and I just, even then at age, whatever, 30, I knew that that was, for me, that was wrong. I mean, the, everything I do is to help souls. So it's not, I don't really sort of have any specific writing prayer. I have a lot of saints you can see in front of me that help me that I look to for inspiration. It, it's, it's, the, it's, it's out of the, it, it's part of the entirety of my ministry um, as a Jesuit. So um, I don't want to overstress the point, but that the day kind of things blending into each other could be seen as owing in part to the way Ignatius set things up. Prior to the Jesuits, um, most religious life was monastic. The um, day was divided by the praying of the office and choir. The, one of the radical Jesuit moves was to have Jesuits live in cities and um, mix the spiritual exercises and prayers into the day rather than segregating them out into hours of prayer. And so is there some continuity between long Ignatian practice and, and what you just described? Yeah, well, it's finding God in all things. And so in other words, the, the, uh, the, the Jesuit ministry part of my life is not just writing. It's, you know, answering phone calls and helping people. It's talking to LGBT people. It's doing uh, seminars and webinars like this. So there, it's all of a piece. And so I don't see any of it more sort of holy or more Jesuit than, than anything else. The other thing I should say, which I know bothers a lot of writers, I, as I said, I never struggle. And maybe it's, maybe it shows in my prose that it's not as, you know, elegant as, um, as all that. But I, and I was watching um, a documentary, the, the documentary uh, on Hemingway on PBS, which I found fascinating. And Hemingway is a favorite of, of mine in terms of writer, if not, you know, his personal life wasn't always uh, that great. And these, and I've, I've never, I don't think I've ever said this before, these comments about, you know, I, I struggle and if I can get one good sentence and that we're obviously different kind of writer and I'm no Ernest Hemingway and I'm not a novelist and I'm not this great sort of, you know, sort of master of the bell letters and things like that. I've never had that problem. I mean, I, I, what I, I, I try to write in a very simple way. I try to write uh, out of a way I need to communicate, but I enjoy it. And so it's not a, it's not kind of, you know, open your, who said open your vein and is that Dorothy Parker or open your vein and let it come out. I think that's one of the, the sort of uh, uh, metaphors about writing that, that is not for me. And so I don't, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. John LaRue, the late uh, mm -hmm. short story writer and novelist who was a Jesuit before he was a, um, mainly a writer, mm -hmm. he, 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 he was told by a student, the student said, I love to write. And he said, oh, that's horrible. Uh, <laughs> and I'm very much identified with the student in that anecdote because I, I love writing. And the fact that I had a full-time publishing job for 18 years made me see the time of writing as the pleasurable part of the day and the time of, of imaginative freedom. Uh, so um, I, I hope I haven't lost that. But not to press the point too much, but I know you mentioned all the saints on your wall. Well, some of those are by, um, probably by Bill McNichols, the uh, Jesuit. Um, yeah, a couple uh, behind me, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as I understand it, there are a lot of artists and probably McNichols is one where the, the act of making the work is itself spiritualized. Uh, and do you understand it all, apart from your goal to help souls, um, the, is the, does, does the thing made by by a religious writer have a different um, status or aura than something made um, by a sports writer or whatever. 
Well, I, I mean, I would hope so. I would hope that it's that, that, that the person who is doing it is, is inspired and is, and is, you know, has a practice of prayer. I mean, the icon, the icon writer is, is praying as he's doing it. I mean, I, I'm with, even though I said that I don't pray before kind of a formal prayer, I am very aware of the spirit when I'm writing. I mean, I'm very aware and the way I experience it to get a little more personal is that I feel very calm and I feel very happy and I feel very much in the groove. And so, for example, this morning when I was writing about Lazarus, I get this spirit of joy. I just, I, you know, I, I, there are certain insights that I'm, I'm sharing with people that I found, you know, in different commentaries and books that I, I find it's, it's consoling to me. I find writing is consoling in, in a, in a strict Jesuit sense. I mean, I feel the sense of peace and comfort and uplift and that's why I love it. Uh, and so I, I hope that the, the religious writer uh, is able to convey that. And I think most are, you know, cause they are writing out of a sense of a desire to help souls, which is just different than a sports writer. It's not that sports writing is bad. I do want to, I do want to go back and say, you know, when one compares oneself to like Ernest Hemingway, you know, I think of someone like Ron Hansen, who's a great, one of my heroes in terms of writing. And, and that's a different kind of writing, writing a novel and writing, you know, real literature is different. And I would imagine that would be hard, right, to sort of make it perfect. But it's I'm writing in a different style and in a different vein. And I think with different expectations in my, my readers don't expect these beautifully wrought sentences. I just try to be clear and distinct, as Descartes would say. They're often pretty beautiful though. Well, thanks. No aspersions cast against sports writers. The reason I made that reference is that I think the quote about opening a vein, I associate with the sports writer, Red Smith. Mm, okay. uh, and that's who I had in mind when you said it. And that's um, uh, that's a, obviously a different kind of writing. He's got to write right after the game ends or, or whatever and convey uh, the spirit of what happened to people mm -hmm. who weren't there. Um, not unlike well, what you're doing in the interior life, but go yeah, on. I would say I would say something else. I'm also not the other the other distinctions I want to make to not denigrate writers. I'm not writing to make a living. Right. I take I take a vow of poverty, so I'm not writing to make a living. There, there's a pressure there. I'm not writing to sell many copies of books because I you know, whatever I sell, you know, goes to the Jesuits. So there's no pressure there. Uh, I'm not writing for reviewers. Right. I'm not writing for a career. Also, you know, I know that a lot of people who write academically have a lot more pressure. Right. I don't have people looking over my shoulder and saying, oh, I don't agree with that. Uh, you know, theology you're putting out. Uh, Spirituality is a little different. You have a you have a sort of a broader um, people are more, more forgiving. So I don't have as much pressure as most people do, as most writers do. And I think perhaps if I were a novelist, uh, you know, making my living off of that, it would be much more, uh, I feel much more pressure, but I, I have an ideal situation. I write what I want. I write as fast as I want. I don't have to worry about how many books I sell. Uh, and it's, it's fun. And I only write what I know. I, and also there's nothing assigned unlike a reporter or, uh, you know, someone who's working in a magazine, no one is saying to me, I want you to write about this topic that you're not interested in. So I'm very interested in Lazarus and I'm only covering the stuff about Lazarus that I'm interested in. So, so I'm very fortunate. I'm very lucky to be able to, to have this position right now. We're fortunate too. There are a lot of questions coming in in the Q and A. And if you are in the audience and have a question, there's still time to post. I'm not sure how many we'll get to, but you can put it in the Q and A. Meanwhile, Jim, there's a passage in the book that really struck me as um, one in which uh, the, the spiritual act, the act of prayer and the act of writing were, were closely aligned. I mentioned it to you earlier in the day, it had to do with the moment when you were asked to produce a specific memory uh, and, you, and you came up with something. Uh, I hope you'll read that passage for us from 181 if you're open to it. Yeah, sure. It's, um, it's actually, uh... It's, it's it so that this passage is from the chapter which i think is the most important chapter in the book what happens when you pray because i think that's the one that most people are curious about and one of the things that happens when you pray one of the things that happens when you sit down and close your eyes is memories sometimes come up and uh i think people sometimes think are they're a distraction uh and they're not and so during a retreat I was, I'll set the scene a little bit. Um, I was praying uh, about God's love for me, which I wasn't particularly feeling on the retreat. It's kind of a generic kind of feeling of God's presence, but I didn't really feel God's love. And I, I asked God to, uh, to show me that, uh, which is a little bold, but Ignatius says, pray for what you desire. So I say that um, out of the blue, I had an odd memory. I was in my childhood home on Christmas Eve 
which was surprising because it was the middle of the summer and I hadn't been thinking about Christmas. When I was a boy, my family owned a tall candle in a glass that was brought out every year for Christmas. The 10 inch candle was nothing special. It probably cost a few dollars. On the outside of the glass, which was covered in sparkly dust that rubbed off a little each year, was the image of a red ornament hanging from the branch of a Christmas tree. The candle was unpacked with the rest of our holiday paraphernalia in mid-December. Every night after dinner around that time of the year, the Christmas tree, electric candles in the windows, colored lights on the evergreen bushes outside our house, and the candle would all be lit. The candle sat atop our old Magnavox stereo system in the living room. Sometimes we would turn off all the lights in the house and watch the tree. The only light in the living room came from the colored lights on the tree and the warm glow of the flickering candle. Here's what I wrote in my journal, unedited. This is from the retreat. I remember such a feeling of warmth and of being loved by God, very gentle, and a feeling of security and of being happy. It was very lovely, and I saw this as one way that God loves. Then, after that prayer period, I'm in a retreat house, uh, Linwood Spiritual Center in Rhinebeck. Grateful for the seeming response from God, I went on a bike ride on a perfect summer day. Later, I wrote in my journal, I was coasting down the hill and felt the wind rush past my ears, and I was transported back to riding my bike to school down the hill. And I could see and feel myself so clearly in my blue jeans and my blue corduroy jacket and baseball cap and felt an intense burst of love for me and God's love for me as a boy. I was moved to tears. So strong and vivid a memory, a real experience of God's love for that boy who I am. I share those experiences not because they are unusual. Memories arise for many people in prayer, and my memories are no more important or interesting than anyone else's. Nor am I sharing them to make myself out to be some sort of mystic, which I am not. I don't have these experiences that frequently, certainly not with that level of intensity. Rather, I'm sharing them to let you see how God can use memories in prayer. In this case, to remind me of God's love for me as a boy and God's love for me now. So it's a, it's a, it's a reminder to people that these things that seemingly come out of nowhere in prayer can be ways that God has of communicating with us. It's so affecting and partly because of your use of details, the Magnavox TV and yeah. the candle with that sparkly stuff that <laughs> yeah. comes off a little more each year. And that's how you make the scene credible. And that's how you make the interior life and the life of prayer so, so credible in this book. Uh, so thanks for the writing. You're welcome. First question uh, will be posed by David Stosser. Greetings, Father Jim. Thank you for this. Um, my question has to do with uh, the, the process of writing and insights that come from it. We often clarify our thoughts through our writing. Do you have an example of a particular insight at which you arrived through something you have tried to articulate while writing? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, David. Um, I knew that I wanted to uh, write a chapter on how we know what ex we experience in prayer is from God. And it's, it's kind of an art, right? And I, I was loath to say, here are the, you know, here are the 10 rules, right? Um, but I knew that I needed to say it because it's something that people struggle with, right? What the, there's, what's the difference between me thinking about that Christmas candle and me thinking about a hamburger when I'm hungry? Clearly, those two things are different. One, you could say, you know, is more likely to come from God. One, you could say, is probably distraction. And because people weren't going to be in front of me, the question is, well, how do I know? It's a really important question for people. And so to your point, I started writing and I really didn't know where I was going at the beginning. Like what, what I, I didn't have any sort of guidelines. And as I wrote, and as it got clearer to me, what I needed to say, I recalled things that I had said to people in spiritual direction. And so I, I, in other words, I didn't have a template. I didn't have an outline for that chapter. I just kept writing and I just kept thinking, well, what if this happens? And what if a person says this? And so to be, I was able to draw on the real life questions that people asked me to the point where I'm, I'm very happy with that chapter. And people have said, you know, thanks for writing it. And it's not something that you see, I'm not sort of uh, puffing the book up. It's not something you see in spirituality books because a lot of spirituality books are very vague. 
and they talk about the fruits of prayer and God communicating with you. And I wanted people to, to sort of be able to say, well, how can I tell? So that was a, that was a, that was an example of writing in a sense to understand what I thought. Great question. Thank you. The next question is from Marianne McGinley. Are you there, Marianne? Let me post the question uh, sure. for her. I have it here. What was your reaction to the Pope's last refusal to bless the union of gay couples, not just as individuals, but as couples? Yeah, I'm not laughing because of the topic. I'm laughing because it, it always comes up these days. Uh, so for those who don't understand, for those who don't know, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith came out with a, a statement, um, a responsum, it's called, to a question that was posed to them about blessing same-sex couples. And they said that priests cannot do it because it's blessing a sin. Uh, I was very uh, saddened by that, uh, primarily because I know many LGBTQ people who were very hurt and upset uh, and really distraught. And a number of people told me truly, and people might dismiss this, but uh, that they were leaving the church as a result of that. For a lot of LGBT people, it felt like the last straw. Um, and I, I think that, you know, when I look at uh, the LGBT, the, the same sex couples that I know, who have been uh, accompanying one another and loving one another and caring for one another, often through illness and distress and struggle. Um, it's hard for me to understand how you could call that sin. I would say that. By the same token, um, I think we need to take seriously um, the reports from people like Jerry O'Connell, our Vatican correspondent, who talked about how the Pope was, um, in a sense, trying to distance himself from that and who may have felt pressure um, for signing that document. But I think the most hopeful thing about this whole episode uh, is the response by many people uh, in the church, including many bishops in Europe, for example, Western Europe, who are very strong about this and very critical of the CDF's language. So uh, in, in a way, this, this has kind of brought this discussion to the fore, and hopefully it'll be a, a fruitful discussion. Thank you, and thanks for the question, Marianne McGinley. The next question is from Madison Fisher. Hi, Father Martin. Thank you for your time. I'm curious how the way that you teach the exam and has changed since you originally wrote the Jesuit guides, nearly everything to now with the new book, Learning to Pray. Well, thanks, Madison. Um, it's more or less the same. Uh, it's a little longer and it's a little more, uh, it's a little fuller because I had uh, just a little uh, more space in this book, but it's more or less the same five uh, steps, which is presence, uh, put yourself in the presence of God, gratitude, review, sorrow, and a grace for the next day. Um, I think in this book, I, I wanted to be clear that there are multiple ways of doing it. And so I also offer some uh, other other people and other resources that, that you know, um, it's a little less sort of tied to that five-step process. So I think maybe a little freer in this book, but essentially the same five steps. Thank you. The next question will be, will be from Deacon Clayton Nickel. looks like, again, the, uh, I'm going to just pose this one myself. Sure. Um, the, the question is, how does the writing that you do um, differ from spiritual journals or the writing that uh, people do during retreats? And where do those two types of writing intersect? Uh, well, as you could probably tell from that passage I just quoted, I would never say something in print like very lovely. That's just that I, but I wanted to reproduce my journal just to show you that in, in all of its sort of artlessness. Uh, you know, in, in a journal, first of all, you're not edited, you're not editing. Uh, and I, I edit constantly to make sure I have, you know, le mot juste and the sentence juste, or at least as juste as I can get it. In a journal, you just, anything goes, uh, you know, you can, you can even draw, um, you can, you can uh, sort of have ellipses and just words and phrases. So it's much, much more raw, I would say. Um, Journaling, as I talk about in the book, uh, I think it's a really important practice because we tend to forget the graces that we've received in prayer. A journal is basically a, it's a, it's a record of the, of the spiritual uh, insights that you've had. Very important on a retreat. I always ask uh, my directees to, to journal. 
um, but it's a different genre. I've often wondered, and um, I could ask Paul this, and I may not never have asked Paul this, if, if he felt that Merton knew that his journals would eventually be read, because that's always been a curiosity for me because they're so beautiful. Uh, but do you think, Paul, did he ever, did, do you think towards the end of his life, as he knew he was well known, that he, they, he would have his journals read? Very much so, because mm -hmm. uh, his closest friends outside the monastery were many of them publishers. Uh, he had long since negotiated this question of, am I a, a, a monk who's a public figure? He, um, he, had, he had given up on um, an, any sense of an absolute private life. Mm. Uh, and I think he was just a, a realist too. He um, had been trained in modern literature and he was reading um, the letters of Hopkins to Bridges when he was in graduate school. And he knew this was just the way things go. Mm. So I definitely think he envisioned an audience. That said, one of the gifts of Merton was that he um, was able to let go of uh, thinking of the audience from moment to moment mm. and and just uh, be be free as a writer. And that's why they're so remarkable. They're um, more remarkable than most of his published books, in my view. I agree. I also, uh, the difference between Merton and me is that I have on the cover of each of my journals, burn this after I die. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's way too personal. The next question is from Mari Liberace, and if I haven't gotten your name right, uh, I apologize. Mora. Mora. Okay. Uh, I was interested, I love all your books, Father Martin. I have read every one of them, and I've attended quite a number of your presentations. But I'm wondering, you're working on Lazarus right now, and I'm wondering if you have considered or thought about writing about Mary and Martha, uh, or any of the women in the New Testament? Well, first of all, Mara, it's so nice to see your face. Uh, Mara is a familiar name to me from my Facebook Live. It's really wonderful to see you. So what's a, what a wonderful treat. Um, so Mary and Martha are a big part of this book, I should say. And there are, there are whole chapters on Mary and there are whole chapters on Martha. I, I find them fascinating. They are endlessly fascinating. Uh, I, I think if I were to write about any woman in the Bible, it would be Mary, I think. It would be Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, but Mary and Martha, I, a little preview. Uh, one of my favorite chapters in this book so far is, um, is it's called, Is Everyone Wrong About Mary? Uh, because uh, there are a couple people that, there's a great scholarly dis d debate, uh, and you can, not, not recently, but, but over the years, uh, of who is really the, model disciple in that story? Is it Martha or is it Mary? So of course we know that, uh, you know, sometimes Mary is elevated as the contemplative one and, you know, Mary, you know, Mary has chosen the better part in that, that great story. But what I found fascinating is you can find scripture commentators who say, well, in the story of Lazarus, it's Martha who is the, she's the avatar because why? She runs out first. She runs out first and she's active and she's, no, 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 actually, it's just the opposite. It's Mary who's the avatar. I just find that fascinating. So there's, there's plenty about both of them in this book on Lazarus. And I, 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 think, uh, I think a book on Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, would be the one that would sort of hook me the most. But that's a great question. Thanks, Maura. Thank you. And what you say, put in mind, there's a beautiful uh, reflection in the book on the memorare which is a prayer uh, to Mary, and which you point out that we're not praying to Mary per se, we're praying to Mary, hoping that she will pray uh, for us or on, on our behalf. Uh, it's really worth looking at in the book if you haven't seen it already. We have time for two more questions, and the first will be from Michael Johnson. Uh, hello. Um, I really wanted to thank you for uh, all the work that you've done uh, on relationships between the church and the LGBTQ community. Uh, I followed you for some while on uh, Twitter, and I really enjoyed reading your posts, particularly uh, those about that issue. But every once in a while, I make the mistake of allowing myself to read some of the comments. Uh, <laughs> and it's really quite disturbing yeah. and, and, and scary how vitriolic some people who consider themselves to be Christians can be. And I just wondered how you avoid letting that affect you. Do you just not read them? Or what, what do you do to... Uh, insulate yourself from such nastiness. 
Well, thanks, Michael. Uh, oftentimes I don't read them, uh, but I, t I talk in the book about an experience I had on retreat. So this is a very appropriate thing to talk about. Uh, briefly, um, I'll, I'll talk about it because uh, it's, it's a long story. And I wrote about this in the tablet recently. Uh, I had a Jesuit in a community I lived in years and years ago who really detested me and um, really just detest, you know, say la vie. And I went to retreat one year and my spiritual director asked me to pray over the passage of the rejection at Nazareth, right, where Jesus is rejected, as you know. And in Ignatian contemplation, this is a great way of introducing this to the discussion, one imagines oneself in a scripture scene. And I imagine saying to Jesus, well, gee, you know, you knew these people in Nazareth and you knew you probably could intuit how they were going to respond when you stood up and, and more or less declared yourself as the Messiah. How were you able to do that, right? How were you able to deal with the rejection? And the words that I heard in prayer, not heard physically or in my ears, but sort of that came to mind were, must everyone like you? And I remember at the time thinking that was an invitation to let go of the need to be liked by this fella in the house, which I was able to. But uh, just a few years later, the book came out and I started to get attacked. And I've told Paul this story. Uh, and I, I was surprised at the vitriol, as you were saying, and that sort of personal nature of the attacks. And I went back to that passage and I went back to that insight in prayer, which was Jesus saying to me, must everyone like you? Right. And so it was an invitation to be free of the need to be loved, liked or approved of. And so even when I see those things, uh, Michael, online, it truly doesn't bother me any longer. I mean, I'm not saying that I'm, I would I want people to attack me. Right. That's the third, as Ignatius would say, that's the third degree of humility. You sort of sort of desire that because it's being closer with Jesus. I'm not there yet, but it, it really doesn't bother me. Um, and I don't I don't lose sleep over it. And and most of the time I don't read them. And a lot of the times I. A lot of these people are, they're bots or they're anonymous or it's, you know, someone in, you know, who, who probably, I, I don't need to really uh, sort of engage them. I don't need to let that in. But, but it was that sort of grace in the retreat that has really helped me so much uh, in this work. Uh, and to quote another um, character in um, Paul Eli's book, Dorothy Day, to paraphrase her, they did it to Jesus. So why wouldn't we expect them to do it to us? Thank so you. my mantra is, Michael, my mantra is who cares? <laughs> that's, that's called detachment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Our last question is from Elizabeth Wallen. Good afternoon, Father Martin. Uh, I'm a tremendous fan. I, I'm actually very surprised that my question got through, so I'm <laughs> delighted to be able to speak with you. Uh, thank you for the gift of your time. My question is, I feel like the joy of this Easter season, Pentecost is my favorite time, and the Easter season is just so full of joy, but Pentecost is particularly, I think, a really sacred time, um, and I think very fitting in the season we find ourselves in right now as we are kind of in this transient phase as the world reemerges into somewhat normality, but still struggling, of course, with, with the pandemic. So I'm curious about um, guidance you have for the balance between grace and discipline. So how can one build more natural discipline or routine uh, while still keeping the organic flow of prayer um, as we emerge as individuals and see more regular routine in some cases? Um, but how do we show ourselves grace as we adjust while still remaining committed uh, into prayer into this organic space that we can form? That's such a great question. I, I think it's a, and, and I'm happy you're able to ask your question too. I think it's a tension. Uh, so I think um, one always, I think one always needs some sort of structure. Okay. Uh, whether it's the breviary, whether it's doing the daily mass readings, whether it's going to daily mass, whether it's doing the examination. In my experience as a spiritual director and as someone who prays, I find that when people don't have structure, it's much more difficult for them to, to pray. So to have some sort of regularity. So for example, as we, I think what your question is, as we kind of move back into kind of a more open uh, way of living, right? And we're doing things, we're going out um, and we're not as monastic, right? I mean, I, I think we've all been involuntary monks for the last uh, year. What do we do? Well, that's where you say to a person, right? You have to have some sort of structure. And it just helps people. I mean, maybe there are people who can pray without structure, but so to say, I'm going to do my half an hour of contemplative prayer in the morning, I'm going to go to mass and I'll do my exam for 15 minutes at night. That's very helpful. I also, it's funny you should mention that, um, Elizabeth, because I've had a number of directees recently, not, not related to anything, who have said, uh, who are very experienced prayers, 
and who have said when I sit, it, it's funny, these, these people have been praying for a while. When I sit down, I don't know what to pray about anymore. You know, I think because, for whatever reason. And so to be able for, for the director to be able to say, and I always do start with the daily gospel readings. Okay. It's a, it's a, it's a structure. It's never going to leave you. There's always going to be a daily gospel reading, start with that and, and try to move from there. But so I would say it's a tension. Uh, but I, I think that, that having some structure, you know, without it being too rigid, uh, helps people, you know, it gives them something to hang things on. So it's like exercising, right? I mean, I, there's a reason why Ignatius calls them the spiritual exercises, right? And, you know, if you, if you know you're going to go to the gym every other day or run every other day or do so many sit-ups or whatever, it, it just helps. It gives, you, it gives you a goal. It gives you a structure and a framework. So it's a great question. And happy Pentecost. <laughs> it's really powerful to think that that's one of the things that's happened during the pandemic, that maybe there has been more space and time for the interior life. Uh, here's hoping so. Jim, I've gotten so much out of this conversation. I, I hope that others have. I'm so glad you joined us. And um, it's hard to believe this is our first event together after more than 20 years. <laughs> there will be others. Uh, this is going to uh, be posted on the Berkeley Center website for uh, people who missed it or had to leave early. And emails will go out. Thanks to the co-sponsors of the event, not only President DeJoya, but the Office of the President, the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, the Office of Mission and Ministry, the Office of Campus Ministry, John Main Center for Meditation and Interreligious Dialogue, and the various um, platforms that have helped us to promote this event. Thank you so much, uh, Father Jim, once again. Um, thanks for joining us. I truly appreciate it. My pleasure. I just want to say thank you, Paul. And really, the the, the tables could be turned very easily. Uh, Paul Eli is one of my favorite writers, and so it's an honor to be to be interviewed by one of your favorite writers and a good friend, too. So thanks to you. Thanks to Georgetown and the Berkeley Center. And thanks to all of you who are watching and please keep me in your prayers.